My name is John Cornicello, and I welcome you to my series of live interactive photo conversations. You can check out the schedule at cornicello.com slash conversations for dates and times of upcoming shows. You can also find links to previous conversations there. Uh, before we start today, I should mention that there will be nude images shown today. So if that offends you, you can drop out. Um, let's see. My guest today is Renee Jacobs. Renee Jacobs is one of the most celebrated photographers of the female form in nude or time. Uh, she's a recipient of prestigious International Photography Award for Fine Art Nudes. Her work has been exhibited and published around the world. Her book Polaroids and the second edition of Paris are scheduled to be released this fall, concurrently with the exhibit of her work alongside Helmut Newton's private property in Barcelona. So please welcome Renee Jacobs. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for joining us. Uh, let's see, I wanted to, so you started out as a photojournalist? Correct, that's right. Yeah, and uh, if I start giving some dates, it'll immediately peg my age. So. Yeah, we don't have to, <laughs> don't have to do that. No, no, but and, I, you know, I, I, I uh, it, it's important, I think, to understand the trajectory because I, I did uh, uh, practice photojournalism for about, uh, six years or so. And, and the first book that I published uh, in, in 1986 was a book of photojournalism. And then I, I took a little detour and I was a, a lawyer for 15 years. So we, we can talk more about that. But yes, that, that was the start. Of photojournalism. Civil rights lawyer. Correct. Uh, civil rights and constitutional litigator. Wow. And then all of a sudden you found naked women. <laughs> As one does. <laughs> <laughs> And I know what that's like. Um, for me, I, I, we don't want to really talk much about equipment, but I noticed you did the Polaroids, Polaroid type 55s. Do you have some secret stash that you still have of a, full, a 55? I, I do not. I do not. Okay. And actually, uh, Tony, who is on this call, and I uh, reconnected after a, a little bit of uh, time apart uh, to chat about just that uh, about a few months ago because I actually am going to Berlin in September to put the finishing touches on my Polaroids book. And the idea was that I was going to shoot brand new original Polaroids, about 30 of them for separate limited edition covers. And we toyed with the idea of trying to resurrect some type 55 out of a cave somewhere, but uh, <laughs> really have been successful <clears throat> trying to do that. So, uh, Pretty soon I'm going to have to reorient myself to uh, all the new Polaroid cameras and films and so on. And uh, we'll continue that idea. But unfortunately, no, the, the Type 55, I do not have anymore. Yeah. Do you still, did you maintain all your negatives from the 55s? I, I did. Uh, and, and that'll be an interesting discussion if, if folks want to have it, because uh, what we're doing is uh, for the, the book of Polaroids, we're using scans of the type 55 positives, but we're also going to make available sil silver gelatin prints from the negatives. Wow. And because I was usually shooting by myself alone out in the field, in the wind, in the dust, and wherever, there have been times where a negative went floating down a stream or a positive <laughs> ended up in a tree and, and that sort of thing, so. Yeah, so we have a, a video that we can show of the Polaroids. So why don't we do that here? Let me just get that set up. Let that come into focus. You can talk over this if you want, or just watch it. Yes, yeah, speaking of uh, photographing in, in conditions, that first one, mountain outside of LA, wind blowing, pretty typical. And I should say, we have a PDF of all these images too, so we can go back to look at Im separate images afterwards. Just wanna run through these. Yeah, I will say that this, uh, this book has been in progress for years. Uh, so I'm, I'm really delighted to finally be pulling it all together. And uh, I think the actual physical uh, product of it, the, the book itself is going to be really beautiful. It's going to have a hand-sewn open spine, 
uh, done by the. Oh, let's well, speaking the of wind. Solaroid. Yeah, this. <laughs> there you go. This was the last Polaroid, the last Type 55 I managed to shoot. After this, that was it. It was gone. So uh, this was in France uh, a couple of years ago, uh, about an hour east of, of where I live in the south of France. And that was it. That, that was it. That was the last type 55, the last sheet. So there we go. That's that's a little pixelated, but uh, yeah, I'll, I'll when we go to the PDF, it'll be much clearer. So just uh, to uh, hit on the the technical aspects of this, because I know we'll we'll get to the uh, emotional and visual aspects uh, later, but. Uh, these were shot, uh, as you mentioned, with the Type 55 film and uh, in a uh, Polaroid 110B converted... Uh, <laughs> On the ground, you know. <laughs> is this your audience? This is a Well, that, that was louder than I remembered it, but uh, <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Yeah, we were uh, shooting on the Grand Canal in Venice, obviously not Polaroid. Uh, and uh, yeah, we, we were entertain entertaining a, a group of uh, Japanese tourists on a tour boat, so. Yeah, Jeff, she was asking about Facebook, YouTube. We're not on Facebook today. And on YouTube, I think I can mark this as an 18 plus video. So we will put it on to, to YouTube. Um, yeah, so I'm going to pop up the PDF so we can look at individual images. Let me do that one here. Um, so here you're yeah. talking about the open spine. Right, exactly. Yeah, you you can see uh, how the Japanese uh, hand binding sort of uh, mm -hmm. spine will, will work. And at the bottom, uh, we're we're still not clear on this, but I think there might be a few uh, ribbons that are supposed to sort of mimic the colors of the uh, Type Fifty Five frame. My mm -hmm. publisher in Berlin is sort of a mad genius. Uh, he's an architect, and I did my Paris book with him and another book uh, that was called Verkdruck um, a few years ago. And uh, he's an architect, I think I, I said by trade. And he puts together just absolutely beautiful uh, books. He, he published probably the, the largest uh, book of Jock Sturgis's work, uh, largest in terms of size. Uh, mm -hmm. It was about half the size of, of a table. Yeah, yeah, let me so know if I, you want to go ahead. Yeah, I, I was just going to say I did obviously shoot some Polaroids in Venice, although not not on the on the boat on the Grand Canal. <laughs> uh, and uh, actually, once we're through Paris, uh, the second edition coming out in the fall and the Polaroids book, uh, Italy is is next up. I have a, a large body of work uh, on Italy. And so I was meaning to turn back to it as the next uh, project. Um, and then of course the pandemic, so. Yeah, so some questions coming in on the chat. Uh, Stephen Gotts was asking if you have someone who specifically keeps a lookout for people that might be approaching or you're doing outdoor uh, figure work. Yeah, usually I do. Um, you know, we're, we're I'm always very, very discreet. Uh, it is not in any way, shape, or form my idea to sort of uh, put this in people's faces and make a statement by by doing nudes in public. It, it's just that's not my interest. Um, you know, so I, I tend to try and be very, very careful. I don't often have lookouts because I usually shoot with just myself and a model or, or, or several models. 
Um, but uh, either the model or I uh, sort of simultaneously function as a lookout. Um, usually if I'm shooting outside, I'll have a model with a, a coat uh, that she can easily open or, or take on or off uh, pretty quickly. But uh, I have had some interesting uh, run-ins <laughs> and uh, there was there was one shoot I was doing on the Bir Hakem Bridge in uh, Paris. And for those who don't know it, it offers a beautiful view back to the Eiffel Tower. And uh, I had the model on the sidewalk uh, with her back to the Eiffel Tower. And my back was to the road that ran through the bridge. And all of a sudden I heard what sounded like a very large truck coming behind me. And of course the light was beautiful and I didn't want to stop shooting, but my instinct said, you know, maybe just put the camera down for a second. And sure enough, it was like right out of a Jean Reno movie, a, a van stop that was probably full of every police person in Paris. <laughs> and uh, they just sort of poured out of, of the van. And uh, there were some women uh, police officers in the van that were just laughing. And uh, one or two of the, the men tried to be sort of officious. And my model, who is actually the cover model in my Paris book, just lit into them. This is beauty. This is art. This is, you know, what are you? And and I just wanted to jump into the sand. Um, <laughs> it, it's it's really not my goal to provoke people that way. Sure. Uh, so I, I I've had my fair share of run-ins. The uh, security guards at the ice skating rink at the Hotel de Ville uh, in uh, in the winter uh, took my one of my cards and erased it. But luckily, I got the photos back. Uh, that was, again, sort of my fault because the model I was with didn't understand that I was telling her in English because my French was so bad to keep covered up. Uh, <laughs> there were way more people at the ice skating rink than I had anticipated because I had gone the night before in the rain and it was empty and I was delighted. But uh, when I saw that it was crowded, I, I and we weren't going to do nude. She was just going, she had a sheer, uh, a sheer shirt on and she was going to open her jacket. And uh, I kept telling her, you know, as I was sort of skidding around trying to stay upright on the ice, I told her to keep her jacket closed and that didn't exactly translate. So, <laughs> uh, I, so I've, Sometimes I've had, they have a mind of their own. <laughs> God bless them. Uh, yeah, so I, I've had uh, my encounters, but I, I don't want to. Yeah, Jim is asking how you work with models to get the look you want. Is it all this? Uh, well, you know, that, it, that's a great and sort of fundamental foundational question. I, it's sort of the other way around. It, it's, you know, how they work with me to get the look they want. Um, you know, I, I very much believe in being uh, a vessel for how these women want to present themselves. And other than uh, sort of minimal directions to take advantage of the best light, uh, I really sort of let them, let them go. Uh, you know, I... They bring what they want to bring, uh, what they want to be photographed in or not. Um, they do their makeup and hair or not as, as they want. Uh, and I, you know, I, my, my biggest thing in doing this is that I want to listen to the spectrum of, of all of these women and, and what they want to say. So, um, yeah, the, the, the question sort of gets flipped on its head. Mm -hmm. Renee, may I ask? If you're you're doing these primarily yourself and the model, um, does that mean you're also not taking additional equipment like lighting or tripods and such? Very very rarely. Um, yeah. Uh, thanks for the question. No, I I very much try to keep it as minimal as possible. Um, with the Polaroid, the converted one ten, I will often stick it on a mono, on a monopod. Sometimes I do that with a DSLR as well, because I, I like to shoot with a very slow shutter speed because I, I really like motion and movement. Um, but other than that, uh, almost uh, never. Um, I played around with some strobes and, you know, I did some studio work, uh, you know, with uh, some Dynalites and, and things like that. And I'd bring, you know, sometimes some strobes, uh, uh, you know, on, on location, but I, I it just, it wasn't the look or the feel that I was going for. I really didn't want the gear and anything else to sort of get in between the relationships with the models. Do other folks have questions about the 
Polaroids that we've been looking at. Mm -hmm. I'll just say they're absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs> Let's see. So you mentioned that you're shooting DSLR. You're not shooting film for your. No, I, you know, I think, no, the, this, this image in back of me was uh, one of my early uh, digital images, but uh, I, you know, I, I, as I mentioned, I took a 15 year break or so from photography to go do this silly law thing. And <laughs> when I got back to it, uh, you know, the world had gone digital. Uh, when I started to um, shoot again, I, uh, I started again with my film camera. So I had a, a Pentax 645, I had my Nikon FMs, uh, and uh, you know, I started shooting film again when I started shooting again, uh, but quickly moved on to digital. Yeah, Jim was asking, there was an image of a model, a uh, blonde model in the desert that was very interesting. Can you talk about the motivations? I'm not sure exactly which image that was. Does it sound right familiar to you? Is it was it the horizontal Polaroid? Could you actually just scroll through those again? Yeah, talking? I just got to pull up that that I closed that PDF. So hang on one second. It's the one that was nude. <laughs> well, that distinguishes it. Yeah, give me one second here to. Yeah, Jim said that was the Polaroid one. He okay. Chat. Polaroids. Okay. Share um, screen. The the question was what was the motivation? Um, light. Uh, you know the I I there aren't many things that I miss about living in the U.S. Um, but uh, that that light in Joshua Tree and the the dry lake bed uh, east. Uh, yeah, she's sitting on her knees. Um, it was uh, end of the day, the light was absolutely stunning. There was this long, beautiful shadow. Yeah, there you go. Uh, the shadow that she was casting, um, you know, she just, to me at, at that moment she, and the light, she looked very elemental. You know, she looked part of that landscape. She looked like one of the sort of uh, rock formations of, uh, you know, in, in the Southwest that you often see and, uh, you know, so much, as I said, so much of what uh, I do with the models has to do with the light. Other otherwise, I, I really like to hear what they have to say, um, you know, the way that they and, want to pose. Or, uh, are most of your subjects or models um, professional models or friends not really. or? I, you know, I, I not really. Um, there are some that were part of, uh, you know, back when I was doing this work uh, in, in LA, there was a, a, a group of traveling models that would sort of go around, you know, to different places. And, you know, I, I would connect with uh, a number of those women, but no, nobody really that I, know, that I can remember is, uh, was with an agency or, you know, was doing modeling exclusively. So Renee, hi. Um, hi really, really love your work. And um, I, I am a great admirer of photographers that can do figure work. Um, I'm good friends with Greg Gorman and I've shot nudes with Greg, uh, both uh -huh. male and female nudes. And, and uh, I just have a personal discomfort level being around other naked people, I don't know, <laughs> but I love seeing the work. And, you know, John does a great job uh, with nudes. Um, I have a lot of friends, uh, a fellow by the name of R. Michael Walker on Facebook, uh, who gets banned at least once a month for, uh, you know, not uh, censoring out the nipples. Um, and I know uh, um, uh, a number of people that do it. Um, but I think just the human figure is particularly when it's attractive. But the thing that I noticed is that you don't do kind of like unattractive people. Is that, uh, not, the, not that you should shoot the grotesque, but you know what I'm saying? It's just kind of, everybody is so just fucking beautiful. <laughs> 
Well, you know, the interesting thing about that and, and welcome to the world of women is that no matter how beautiful they are to us, they always have something or more than one thing that they absolutely hate about the way they look. And so my, my job is not to sort of seek that out or highlight it. You know, my job is to find whatever they, they find is empowering within themselves. So, you know, it, it all looks, you know, there, there's sort of a, a luxurious sheen to it all, you know, from the outside, but these women, uh, you know, they're doing this for a reason. Uh, I think I saw a, a question pop up as to whether any of the models are paid and, and no. Uh, I mean, I, I run workshops and when I, when I do workshops uh, and bring models in for workshops, then yes, obviously I pay them. But no, for, for my work, uh, I've, I've never paid a model. It's all been uh, trade or good friends or, you know, I, I owe you a bottle of wine. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it, it's a whole different uh, thing. So you know, my idea, my, my philosophy is really to find what empowers them. And when I find what empowers them, it empowers me. Um, and that's really the biggest motivation mm -hmm. because you know, uh, for so long, I was told many things about how I should live, how I shouldn't live, what I should want, what I shouldn't want, what I should do. And when I started to do this work and started to be exposed to the spectrum of how other w women were living and what they were dreaming about, what they were fantasizing about and how they wanted to present, it was revelatory. It, uh, you know, it gave me you know, the, the spectrum was like this. And if, if I wanted to inhabit, you know, one little pinpoint uh, somewhere on that spectrum, it was perfectly acceptable because look at the variety here. You know, it, it, um, uh, it, it that's sort of what perpetuated the work for me. Mm -hmm. Do you do any commercial work? Um, I do private commissions. Uh, well, mm -hmm. I, a couple of things. I, I do private commissions. So I've had any number of women who uh, were getting divorced or getting married or, you know, uh, having a certain birthday that have hired me to, uh, to, sh to shoot nudes of them and I make them into handmade books and, and that sort of thing. And really, other than that, the only real commercial work I do is I love to shoot food because I, I find <laughs> food to be not as erotic as women, but, uh, but it's, sensuous. It's good, yeah, it's, it's a pretty good compliment. Yeah. I think Michael Newler would had asked about commercial work and he was referring to Robert Farber, who's kind of split between his art and doing, doing his nudes for commercial clients. Yeah. I don't know if you're familiar with Robert Farber. Yeah. 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 I know Robert. Yeah. How well do you know guess. Robert? I uh, just, uh, we've met a few times. Um, you know, haven't haven't been in touch with him for a long time. Um, when I was still living in LA, we'd run into each other from time to time, but I, I don't know him well at all. So Renee, yeah, Michael and him go back to childhood friends. <laughs> really? Yeah. Well, please tell him I say hello. <laughs> yeah, Newler oh, still owes him money. Um, Renee, let me ask, there's a photograph on your website of a woman nude, I assume with, um, I assume it's at a, the dry lake bed in uh, Joshua Tree somewhere, uh, with fabric flowing behind her. Um, yeah. And, and I, I'm guessing that was a lucky occurrence or did you stage that somehow with the fabric? What's, what's really, it, that was actually the same shoot as, as this uh, behind me. What's, what's really funny, and uh, I probably should never admit this, is it was staged, but not by me. Uh, I was shooting with some photographer friends and the photographer had brought the fabric and that photographer was actually shooting that model from straight ahead. And I was standing off to the side and I thought, wow, that's absolutely stunning, you know, because it was going behind her. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, so yeah, that was, that was a, a lucky coincidence. I, I, it's probably the first only first last and only time that I've sort of, you know, crashed another photographer's, uh, idea <laughs> i know it, it's so tough sometimes to not when you see something from a different angle that's happening it, I, I totally understand that uh daniel has a good question here do you find that any of the models that are unpaid get upset when they see you publishing your photos presumably for a profit no 
Um, you know, because and besides books are not profitable. <laughs> yeah, I you know, I mean it, it's not exactly like um, you know, we're we're running Fort Knox around here. Um <laughs> No, because, you know, my, many of them are, are longtime friends and, uh, you know, we're in touch over time. And, you know, some of these women have never really modeled before. So, you know, we would shoot and then they'd actually have images, uh, you know, that they were comfortable with uh, sort of dipping a toe into the, the world of nude modeling. And then they could take mm -hmm. those and sort of spin them into you know, profit by, you know, doing other uh, photographers workshops or, you know, uh, paid work that way. So yeah, not, not really. Um, yeah. Do you at least give them a signed print? Yeah. Well, actually back in the day, I not only was I giving them a signed print, um, I was giving them a, a, a DVD or a CD uh, with, you um, retouched images, both uh, web res and actually high res. So uh, there are a number of models uh, out there floating around with high res uh, files of themselves that they can actually, you know, print any way they want. Can they sell them? They shouldn't, um, you know, and I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm happy to talk to them about that if, if they want to do that, um, you know, and, and I uh, actually, there's one of my uh, models, a uh, good friend that I'm, I'm going to be doing some prints for her uh, and bringing them with me when I go to the States in about 10 days uh, and giving them to her to sell on her only fan site and, and that sort of thing. So, yeah, I mean, I, the, the idea is that we're all in it together and, mm -hmm. you know, anything I do to help them. I try uh, anything they can do, you know, they, they <laughs> sometimes I fall out of touch for a while. We reconnect on social media. This just happened the other day with a model that's uh, going to be in my Paris book. And I, I put the uh, image of her on, on Instagram. And I, I thought I'd been following her. We followed each other. And then somebody pointed out, oh, this is so-and-so. Oh God, that's such a great picture of her and tagged the model. And then we reconnected and she posted it and, oh my God, this is so great. You know, I, this one didn't make it in the first edition of Paris book and, you know, so on. So do all um, your, do all your models sign models releases? Yeah, I won't, I won't shoot with anyone that doesn't, um, you know, both, uh, that that's my background as a lawyer and, uh, you know, early on in, in the photography, you know, when I didn't get those and then I started getting published and every publisher with any ties to America demands the, the model release. But, it, but uh, in the models release, is there anything in it that, 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 uh, that says, uh, you know, uh, quid pro quo or, or you know, uh, this for that? Um, I don't remember. I haven't used one in a long time. I haven't shot in a long time uh, with the pandemic. Um, there's usually, you know, a, a, something that defines the trade, basically. Um, you know, I will give you uh, a CD of images or, you know, so on or so forth. And The valuable consideration clause. <laughs> there you go. I yeah. mean, there's always a quid pro quo or it's not a contract. You know, there's got to be value exchange for value. So. Mm -hmm. right. Who typically purchases your, 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 your prints? Do you go through galleries or do they come to you personally? Uh, usually uh, directly. Um, you know, I, I've worked with some galleries on sort of solo shows. I have, I have an exhibit coming up uh, alongside Helmut Newton's work in Barcelona in October. And, uh, you know, we're, we're looking to spin that into more of a continued gallery representation. But for the most part, uh, I make direct sales. Um, you know, I, uh, <laughs> I, I, right before I moved from Los Angeles to France, uh, I had one collector that basically bought almost my entire archive. Um, we we wow. negotiated a price, and I said, "Okay, it's going to cost me this much to move all this, uh, <laughs> all these things over. So let's factor that in." And uh, you know, so I got boxes and boxes of prints uh, went out the door then. So do you do your own printing? Uh, up to about 17 by 22 inches. Uh, I have mm -hmm. an Epson, uh, you know, I have an Epson 3800, 3880, whatever it is upstairs. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I'll, uh, I'll print up to about that size. And 
you know, I print, uh, I make handmade books and that sort of thing. As oftentimes, you know, custom order, a, a collector will come to me and say, uh, you know, I like these 20 images. And so let's make a handmade book uh, out of that. So yeah, nice. most of that sort of thing I'll, I'll print here. Great. Uh, curious, let's I'm go curious. look at some, go ahead. I'm curious, what, what was the, um, what was the thought behind moving from the United States to France? Um, most of my collectors are here. Uh, most of the galleries that I've worked with are here. A ton of models were here right. okay. uh, in about 2011 through 13. I was spending a lot of time in Paris working on the Paris book. And, uh, you know, it was financial, it was lifestyle, all of it. Um, mm -hmm. I'd like to say it was political, but it wasn't. Uh, <laughs> no, no, you can was, say that. <laughs> Well, it, it, although it's not true, I, you know, I, I we, we actually moved in about November, 2016. Uh, mm -hmm. So, um, but the, the, the motivations were mostly lifestyle, financial, you know, I, at that point I'd been living in LA for 17 years and, uh, you know, it, it felt like I was sort of just surviving at that point, not, uh, not really living. So, we had actually just, it was funny because we had just completed a, a workshop in Tuscany and we were, we went over to Arles from Tuscany. This is uh, 2015, I think. And one of my model friends uh, that was in my book and she was in the exhibit I was having in Arles at the time uh, came down. Uh, she lives in the Ardèche, so a couple hours north of Arles. And she, we had wanted her for this workshop because she's so fabulous and she couldn't make it, but she came down to spend time with us and we were telling her how the workshop went. And she just laughed and she said, well, that, that's great, but you could have done it for a fifth of the price, you know, up where I live. You could have, you could have rented the castle, the villa, the whatever. And uh, so we went back to LA and that, that sort of stuck in our heads. And uh, then my wife uh, had surgery. And so she was down for the count for uh, months and months and months. And so this friend in France started sending us places to rent for future workshops, you know, links to this place and that place and the other place. And then she started sending us links of places to buy. She, real, realtor links, immobilier, uh, as they say over here, uh, mm. links um, about places to buy. And it was ridiculous. I mean, it was just astounding. Um, hectares and hectares of land, beautiful old stone buildings, uh, for, for nothing, I mean, you know, compared to the U.S. So we made a plan to, uh, I hate friends like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. Um, I'm, I'm curious <laughs> about one other thing. Yeah. So the picture behind you is terrific. How did you get to hang that on that stone wall? <laughs> See, now that's where other friends come in. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, I, I thought I was relatively handy, you know, back in LA. I, I could ha hang a picture or two. I laid some tile in my kitchen and in my bathrooms. And then I got here with the old stone buildings and everything is, is different. You know, all the materials are different. Um, but, you know, luckily we made friends fast. And uh, yeah, <laughs> what, what the, the even more interesting story is what this wall looked like when we moved in. It was plastered over, but it was water oh. damaged. And, and just terribly water damaged. And uh, we kept trying to fix it and repair it. And finally, you know, my wife said, based on where this is, you know, I think this used to be the end of the house, you know, basically the outside of the house. I'll bet there's beautiful stone over there. Crack, you know, she just took a hammer to it. So, <laughs> so, so that, uh, yeah. That does beg a, a question um, that you're married uh, to your wife. Uh, Greg Gorman, who's actually a good friend, he enjoys both male and female nudes, uh, although his male nudes tend to be maybe a little bit more erotic and a little bit less figure uh, studies, um, but you don't shoot males. Um, I, you know, it's funny because I, I have uh, and, I, and I would. Um, this is part of the, you know, somebody asked about commercial work. Um, there's a uh, bed and breakfast. I don't, Tony, I don't know if you know uh, Sanke, Sanke and Set, Sanke Set uh, in Ruhan. 
Um, but there's a, a gay run uh, bed and breakfast, uh, not, not terribly far from us. So we got in touch with them and said, you know, I would make available the sort of private commissions that I do for your, your clientele if they were interested. And so, uh, you know, for shits and giggles to see how it would work, I came over and I photographed some friends of theirs and we had a blast, you know, we had, we had a great time. And, uh, you know, I think the photos are good. Um, you know, I, I might need to, to do a little work in that area. Uh, cool. But, uh, you know, I, I, I think there's, you know, people are people and comfort is comfort and, you know, joy and eroticism are pretty universal. And, and I think if you're willing to listen to what people have to say about that, it's, it's nothing but enriching. Well, I enjoy your work from the standpoint of the figure, not so much from the standpoint of erotica. Um, and I got nothing against erotica. I like pornography and all that. <clears throat> but um, uh, what was also interesting, I don't know if you're aware of this, uh, I've become friends with a bunch of people on Facebook, but uh, some group of that, because of the friends that I've got with um, nude photographers or photographers that shoot nudes. I don't know, John, do you shoot in the nude? Most photographers are dressed when they shoot. Um, that's a joke. I do though. selfies once in a while to practice yeah, okay. lighting. <laughs> oh, okay, I didn't, I don't, don't, don't send me those. Um, but the um, uh, interesting thing is that there are a couple of um, uh, models, one in Montreal and one in England and maybe Belgium, that are nude model, models, but because of the um, lockdown and in, in COVID, of course, models couldn't go anywhere, they couldn't make a living, and they started doing uh, remote uh, shooting, um, remote control of the cameras. So you'd have, uh, the model would have an assistant control the camera and the lighting, and then you actually com control the camera using uh, uh, software. Um, and then they would send the uh, 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 raw files to you for processing. Um, I, I, I found that incredibly ingenious, number one, that they came up with that. And, and I've seen some really interesting, nice work done that way. Um, but remote shooting of nudes, I thought, well, that's, um, uh, if you can't get to England to shoot a, a model, you could do it remotely. They live in interesting times. Yep. Renee, when you exhibit, how do you, or what is your thought process on deciding how big or small a print should be for any given image for you? Yeah, boy, uh, thanks for that question. It, it's, it's tough. Um, it, it's really tough. Um, I, I don't have a set answer to that. So much of it depends on the space itself. Um, you know, we're, we're in the process now of figuring out uh, what's going to go into the exhibit, you know, alongside Newton's work. New Newton's work is defined for this exhibit. There's a, a body of work he has called Private Property, and it's 45 silver, I think silver gelatin prints, and they're not <clears throat> terribly big. And so we're playing with what kind of dialogue we can we can have with those? Um, the gallerist uh, wants to print them uh, most of the work quite big, and then we're toying around with um, what to do with the Polaroids, whether to exhibit the originals, which of course are just basically four by five, four by six ish, um, you know, in sort of shadow boxes. And he, um, the gallerist, uh, you know, has we we've talked about the idea of making that sort of very intimate, um, you know, in, in terms of how that, uh, how the Polaroids would look. So I, yeah, you know, I've there's, the, go ahead. I've said I was seeing the Maple Thorpe's Polaroids in museums. Mm. So it does work. You, you just have to get up close to them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's interesting because the scans, you know, I mean, the, the, I mean, the positives rather of the Polaroids are, um, you know they're they're challenging. They're um, you know they're they're scratched and there's dust and uh, you know I tried to preserve them, coat them, baby them, protect them as best I could. But you you saw the uh, and and actually it's funny because that one um, photograph, uh, the one video of me shooting that last Polaroid, 
uh, I actually had some folks with me, which which was rare. Um, usually it's, you know, it's, it's me all by myself. I can't even remember why. I, I guess uh, when we first moved to France, we had, uh, there's a site here called Workaway where you can bring folks in to stay uh, and they'll help you with various projects around the house and you feed them and you know they stay for a while and then they, they sort of move on. So you saw a, a guy uh, sort of off to the side for a, a moment or two while I was shooting. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, was, uh, he was one of those guys. So I think we were just sort of on a, on a field trip, uh, a, a bunch of us, and, and we might've had it uh, in mind to see if we could actually shoot the last Polaroid or so. so. Yeah. I, I, you know what, I, I think that was actually at the tail end of a workshop. That, that was at the tail end of a workshop. What, uh, what, uh, what other photographers, be, what other uh, photographers and or uh, uh, artists, painters, uh, influenced you? Yeah, um, you know, the, the photographers um, are, uh, you know, I, my, my people often ask me, you know, if, if I think women take better photographs of women than, than men do. Um, and, and, you know, I, I have to say my, my favorite photograph ever taken of a woman is by a man, a Frenchman, uh, Edward Bouba. Uh, it's, it's an image called Lella. Tony knows this from our, our last conversation about this. And, um, you know, I, I uh, love all the, the old, uh, you know, French photographers, Laura Teague, Cartier-Bresson, um, you know, I, I'm, it's funny because I'm discovering uh, a whole bunch of uh, female photographers that uh, gravitated around Paris in the 20s and 30s that I didn't even know about. Uh, Marianne Breslauer. Um, Sarah uh, Moon. Number of Pardon? Sarah Moon. Sarah Moon. Um, yeah, uh, love, love her work. Um, you know, there are so many uh, photographers that are running around doing Polaroids and doing selfies, and they're really not part of the, the sort of, uh, you know, photo world or the art market, as it were. And, uh, you know, I, they're very inspiring. I see them, you know, on social media all the time. Painters, uh, you know, Modigliani. Um, yeah, it, it just, it, it's, it's endless. And uh, another reason that I wanted to move to France, because what's amazing here is that there is a photo festival in every hameau uh, that, that's bigger than my kitchen table. You know, it's like if, if you get four French people together, they will have a photo festival by tomorrow. Um, and it's just, it's incredibly inspiring. So do your prints tend to sell as loose prints or framed? Uh, loose, um, <laughs> you know, I, I usually uh, give that, uh, you know, I, I usually leave framing to, to other folks um, yeah. because they, you know, they know where they want to hang it and what it wants, what they want it to look like. So. And Daniel's as... asking for the name of that French photographer again. Sure. Uh, Edouard Bouba. So it's E-D-O-U-A-R-D uh, e uh, for the first name. And the last name is Bouba, B-O-U-B-A-T. And I'm probably mangling the pronunciation of both. <laughs> both parts of his name. But the, the photograph that I referred to is, uh, it's called Lella. Uh, and I, you know, I've heard various stories about it. Um, you know, I, I've heard that it was uh, a woman he fell in love with after the war who was a nurse, uh, you know, and I, I've, I've wanted to go back and spend some time really digging into it. But I mean, that photograph to me, I don't know why anyone bothered to photograph women after that photograph. It, you know, <laughs> to me, it, it has everything. It's got longing and emotional intelligence and loss and, and lust. And it, it, it's, it's sort of everything to me. So. Great. Well, so talking about France and Paris, let's show some of the Paris photos. I'm going to bring up the PDF for that. Let's see. Is that showing for you? It's very it small. Is uh, let me. There we go. So I'll go through this one slowly. If there's any comments you want to make or if people have questions, please feel free.
are these um, film or digital, Renee? Digital. Yeah, I don't, uh, you know, I shot some Polaroid in, in Paris, j just a few, um, but uh, I don't think I shot any other, any film, film there. It was all digital. Was this one commissioned or just an idea of yours to create? Uh, another great question. Um, I went to Paris like so many people do because I was in a really low point in my life. And um, because I was shooting, I just sort of continued to shoot. And I, I went there more with the idea of sort of, uh, sort of doing some repair work on myself. And, you know, I, I sh was shooting because I shoot and that, that's what I do. And I connected with women and, and we shot. And one thing led to another and uh, I ended up deciding to go back um, for a second time and this was after i had not been in paris for about 30 years um and uh, it was right uh, sort of after my legal career ended and uh you know so i i, I was doing other things than really thinking about a, a book or a project um you know i was just shooting because that's what i do <laughs> excuse me but um after the second trip when there you go yeah edward buba um after the uh, second trip, and I, you know, I was posting some things on social media, a publisher contacted me, uh, actually a Parisian man who had moved to Santa Fe. And this Parisian man said, uh, I absolutely love what you're shooting in Paris. We need to do a book of this work. And I said, fabulous, that's fantastic. And so I continued to go back uh, over the course of about you know, two and a half years uh, every other month or every third month, I'd go for a couple of weeks at a time. And uh, then the publisher decided that the work was way too erotic and he ran screaming from the project, um, huh. which, which was probably one of the best things that ever happened to me, yeah. so. <laughs> um, I have a question about some of these images. Um, yeah. Um, the, the shots that you took over at the, um, uh, the museum, outdoors at the museum, uh, and the one that you took on the bridge. Um, yeah. It looks like most of these images are, are shot either very, very late at night or, or night, not quite before sunrise. Yeah, uh, true. So that, because there's, 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 no, there's no people around at all. Right, right. Again, I, you know, it is not my interest or intent um, at all to, uh, you know, put this in people's faces. Uh, you know, plus the the light is uh, really just lovely, you know, at, at those times. And and I like, I like movement. You know, I, I like I like to me movement in in my photographs represents things on the periphery of your your eye and your emotions and so on. So, you know, bad quote unquote bad light uh, doesn't bother me you know I, I i love it actually my first reaction when i saw them was i have to sh start shooting more black and white in paris because i hate those yellow sodium vapor lamps that are everywhere <laughs> <laughs> what was the name of edward's photo that you thought should be the that was the end all and be all of of photography yeah, um, Lella, L-E-L-L-A, -L -L and that, that was her name. I, I have to just say a, a, a quick hello to Harris. Uh, I, it's Philadelphia's in the house, I see. <laughs> Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Lovely to see you. Lovely to see you. This is great. I was looking forward to seeing you. On, yeah, that's on, the, on the photographs of, of Paris, yeah. Did your models collaborate with you ahead of those portraits, or did you have this idea in mind, uh, the sequence that you showed? Yeah, very, very rarely um, do I have anything in mind. Um, you know, it, it, for me, it's all about the light and, and what the model wants to do. So if, you know, if, if suddenly the, the light is fantastic, um, you know, then we, we run here, we run there, and, uh, you know, so much of it is, is what the, um, 
you know, the model wants to do. My, my wife loves to tell the story of, um, we were in Tuscany and uh, some journalists were coming to uh, interview us about uh, some work and the workshops we were doing and what we were doing there. And so they, they had this, we were staying at a villa where the workshop was and they had this magnificent table that went for about, I think a mile and a half out into the Tuscan <laughs> Hills and we were having dinner. And, um, you know, I, I didn't realize that everyone was sort of waiting on me to finish a course, to go to the next course, to the next course. And I'm, I'm the world's worst drinker. I, I am such a lightweight. So they kept plying me with wine and plying with me with wine. And it was one of these beautiful Tuscan summer nights, pitch black, pitch black, um, except for maybe five stars. And I stood up and apparently announced that the light was absolutely perfect. And I grabbed a couple of models and we ran off into the night and, and started photographing. And everyone thought I was absolutely insane. And, and it was, you know, it was mostly more drunk than insane. But the photographs actually are really cool. You can see the stars, you can see, you know, so uh, mm -hmm. yeah, the light, it's all about the light, even when there's no light. Have then you, I guess it's really about the wine, but. Renee, have you, have you taken great portraits of your wife? I yes. Um, although what's what's really funny is that we disagree sometimes on what the best ones are. Um, you know, it, it's interesting because there have been books about um, you know photographers uh, photographing their wives, um, mm -hmm. but it's always been men. And you know, one of the interesting things is I actually interviewed Karis Wilson, uh, Edward Weston's wife, mm -hmm. and and muse, although she she hated the word muse, um, but I, I uh, interviewed her not long before she died, and um, you know because I wanted to understand it was for one of the photo magazines, might have been black and white, but I, I really wanted to understand more that dynamic, um, you know, and and for those who are interested in that, I'd say pick up her autobiography. I think it's uh, something like from through another lens. Okay, yeah. Uh, just a really fascinating read. Um, but yes, yes Paris I, Wilson. <laughs> yeah, um, I I think I've done some beautiful photographs of of my wife, and uh, you know, if the the writers, uh, editors, that published those previous books, want to circle back and include some same sex couples, we're we're, we're here for it. Um, she and I might uh, might might have to flip some coins about, and, and we do this every. <laughs> Every book and every exhibit, uh, we're we're going through some things now about you know what's what's going to go in the in the um, in the Paris book, the second edition, and what's going to go uh, alongside the uh, Helmut Newton exhibit, and um, she like she loves some that I'm okay with, and I love some that she's okay with, but uh, <laughs> yeah, between between the two of us, I think we agree that there are a fistful of really nice in images. Hey, um how long were you working on the Helmut Newton exhibit before? Um, well, how long were you working uh, working on the uh, organization that handles the Helmut Newton estate before they uh, said, okay, let's do an exhibit with you? Luckily, I was totally removed from all of that. Um, and, I, and I still am. I, uh, <laughs> when my Paris book came out a few years ago, I actually sent it to the Newton Foundation because I thought it would make a fantastic exhibit. How long the, ago? That was probably about two, three years ago. You know, and I got a very nice letter back from Matthias uh, Harder, who uh, runs the foundation. He said, well, you know, usually we really sort of keep those sort of concurrent or joint exhibits to people that knew Newton or worked with him. And, you know, but he was lovely. And he said, anytime you're in Berlin, you know, stop by. Fast forward a couple of years and uh, last, July. So, so about a year ago, uh, I get a message from the um, uh, this gallerist in Barcelona who said uh, at, at Photo Nostrum Gallery, and he said, um, I have been in touch with the Helmut Newton Foundation about doing uh, an exhibit of Newton's work here, and I would like to exhibit you uh, alongside him because I, I think that would be really fascinating. The, the dialogue between your work, I think, would be great. So this was the, the brainchild of uh, the gallerist in Barcelona, and he has been dealing with the foundation. I, I have had no dealings with them on, on this. Hmm. 
Michael, did you have something else you were, you were no, asking? No, I'm, I'm, I'm actually trying to remember um, the, uh, the guy's name that I, 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 I still know, but I only know, all I can remember because of my chemo brain, uh, is his first name is Ian. Not the Ian that we all know and love, but uh, Ian that uh, uh, was with the uh, Helmut Newton Foundation for a very long time. And then he decided to leave about two, three years ago uh, and he's uh, now uh, he's he went left England and went to Germany, but I, I can't remember his his last name. Ian Ian something. I thought maybe you know. Okay. Him. Well, yeah. totally off topic is Harris here. Where'd your beard go? Let me see it. <laughs> Harris, say oh, something. I, so you I pop decided up to, I decided to get a trim, but now I look surprisingly like. Um, um, like Gabe, Gabe from uh, you know Welcome Back Cotter. I don't know what happened exactly. But, um, <laughs> oh man, I would kill for those curls. Look at that. <laughs> I, you know, she a friend a friend of my my cousin's wife is a hair cutter hair stylist, and I said yeah, I trust you and I like to keep it long. And so she said, look, it's not it's not in your eyes. And now I'm like I'm not feeling like a surfer punk anymore. So I mean, just two weeks ago, your beard was about three times as long as it is. I now. know. I know. I told her to trim only the sides because I said <laughs> Mueller likes it really long. And uh, I don't know. I don't like that. I didn't like it long. You look like. <laughs> yeah. You look like. Uh, what's my call from the, from the Tonight Show? Girls or not, I just like to have that much hair. <laughs> <laughs> well, you no. do. All you have to do is transplant it from here to here. <laughs> I, do, I do a podcast with a gentleman named Michael O'Neill. And he, he's very successful. He has a podcast called The Solopreneur Hour. And um, he's also like turned into a Porsche fanatic and he rebuilt a Porsche from the ground up. And now he's doing what I think what he calls the bastard replant. And um, he's putting in a, a, a modern, really powerful flat Subaru, you know, engine six into a Porsche 911 because they actually fit. And um, and so, and he's putting dual turbos on it. So, um, so he, he did just did a podcast, not to totally divert this, but <laughs> and I actually, I think it's interesting because it is, it's not covered in photography. He went and flew to Istanbul to have a hair transplant. And, um, and it sounds crazy, but it cost him $2,400 to a, a, like a clinic. That's all they do. And they're one of the best in the world. And now he looks like a camel. Well, no, no, yeah, well, you know, and, and it would have been 24,000, but he did a whole video about his hair and about transplanting it, and um, and he talks about that men are not seen in a good light if they do that, but women, of course, take advantage of a lot of different procedures and products that men don't have advantage to, so it's interesting, and he's gotten a huge response from people for doing that, and uh, it just looks okay. incredible. It looks Let's bring this back painful. to Renee. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that, Renee. That's okay. Um, it was Ian Lopez. Ian Lopez. Oh, that's right. Ian. What, you looked it up? And Google is your friend. <laughs> yeah, but I can't do it while I'm, while I'm on this. I, I didn't want to be discourteous. But he's, yeah, he's Ian not, Lopez. Do you, uh, yeah. where, where's Renee? Where'd Renee go? <laughs> She's there. Hello. Renee, so do you know Ian Lopez? I do not. Oh, he's a terrific. He, he he was terrific, absolutely terrific guy. He's in the he's in the Netherlands. He's now the manager of pro business development for That's Sony right. Benelux. Yeah, and how long how long was was he with the Helmut Newton organization? He was a big mocker there. Anyway, so Renee, do you have anything else you want to add? Well, yeah, I want to know how many people from Philly we actually have on this because I'm I'm hearing some Philly accents and some Philly you know sort I'm of a things. North Jersey person <laughs> okay I, I I thought you were on the cusp I thought you were on the cusp I'm I'm, I'm, I, I'm originally from Livingston New Jersey I la okay. now live in Long Island and Long I'm Island. the other Island. side of the state I'm, I'm from Pittsburgh originally even though I'm in Dallas now okay and, and I left Philly about uh 15 years ago. Okay. And I'm, I'm yeah. calling you from uh, Southern California right now. Oh, really? Okay. 
Hi, Malcolm. I'm from yeah, Cheryl's in New Jersey. And Malcolm's in Toronto. Robert's from Philly. Well, Renee, you how, know, we're, where are you originally from, Renee? Philly. Yeah, oh, Philly. originally from Philly. And then I spent 10 years in Portland, uh, Oregon, and then LA for 17. But uh, yeah, we're, we're actually going back to the States on July 9th. So I'm, uh, I'm going to get my dose of tasty cakes and uh, yeah, I'm good. <laughs> Yeah, sloppy Billy's cheesesteak and... sandwiches, pastrami, and, pizza, and bagel, bagels. bagels. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, they do a right. lot of things right in France, but they don't do those. Hmm. Renee, so do, before you know we... Jacques, do you know Jock Sturgis? Yeah, um, Jock actually laid out, uh, edited, and wrote the introduction for my first book with uh, this publisher, uh, uh, Gallery Vive, that I'm, I'm working with now as well. Uh, I met Jock er, uh, early on um, APA San Francisco Advertising Photographers of America, one of the trade organizations that I was involved with, um, <clears throat> helped. Uh, we, we got some legal aid help for Jock when the FBI raided his uh, right. uh, studio and literally took everything. And right. it was really uh, years before he got his stuff back. And he never got everything back. I mean, um, what, he, when what they, he did get back was damaged. Yeah, a lot of it was damaged. Yeah, and um, so I got to meet uh, and talk with Jock, and and uh, um, it really is kind of a question of taboo. Although he tends to shoot younger women than you do, it is still the question of Puritan um, ethics, uh, such as the uh, Christian far right. Um, careful, um, careful, careful, huh? Careful, 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 yeah, careful. careful. Why? I don't give a oh. fuck. I'm, I'm an atheist, <laughs> <laughs> I'm a devout atheist, but and I'm a devout I'm, Jew, yeah. Well, which is more of a of an atheist than a Christian. <laughs> uh, but back to Jock Sturgis, but back to Jock Sturgis, um. You moved to France, which basically would embrace your style of photography as opposed to the United States, in which probably a third of the country would think you're demon seed by by photographing uh, nude women. Um, but yeah. you don't have to deal with the politics here, uh, well, unless you have a big show opening. But uh, Greg Gorman has the same problem. Um, the funniest story that I have about Greg and nudes, he, he did work with Epson and at a photo expo in New York, we, Greg had this great big huge print show and, and book on male nudes and it was really funny to see these little Japanese guys from Epson because Epson was a sponsor um, looking at, close up leaning over <laughs> and looking real close to these big penises that were on, on and and you know talking 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 and and at the end of the meeting or when the the Epson people were going he great thought he was going to get a lot of shit because of the bail nudes and the and the little Japanese guys through their translator said ah oh, you have really excellent detail in the penises <laughs> And it's funnier than hell. The, the point I guess that I'm making is that um, dealing with the subject matter of nudes is something that is somewhat uh, taboo, at least for the for those people that don't have the ability to think for themselves and have to have somebody else tell them how to think. So I want to interject something here. Get, oh. I want to. Jeff is right to a point, <clears throat> but. Um, there's Playboy, there was Penthouse, there was uh, 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 an enormous amount of magazines that did, did exactly that. And those publishers made a fortune, oh, yeah. an absolute right. fortune. So somebody here in Absolutely. the United States, somebody here in the United States, all right, as religious as they say they are, or would like to think that they are, were paying a lot of money to look at those 
lewd, lascivious, wonderful images in those magazines. Well, that's like, that's like here, in te- here in Texas, the biggest liquor stores are in the counties next to dry counties. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Renee, I, I'm wondering uh, if you could share uh, some ideas of what you would like to shoot in the future. Well, you know, I, I'm so envious of photographers that shoot with projects of mine. Uh, in mind, um, you know, the idea of a project. And I, I never sort of really shoot that way as much as I, pro- projects to me are locations. So, you know, I have a body of work on Italy once these two books come out in the fall and, and they exhibit, and then we, you know, maybe get into springtime. Um, you know, I'd like to continue on that body of work in Italy and, and hope that will be the next book. And, uh, Without without revealing too much about it, I, I can say uh, to expand on the, the questions about photographs of my wife, the, the cover for the Italy book is definitely going to be my wife because we we got a shot in Venice that is just terrific. So uh, you know, so we 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 both have uh, a, a, an emotional investment in um, you know in, in going back to Italy and getting that body of work completed. So. I know, I know four guys, I know four guys, <clears throat> myself, Jeff Shiwi, Dan Steinhardt, and Seth Resnick, that would be wonderful models to do <laughs> the next book of Springtime in Germany with Renee. <laughs> well, you know, let's make it happen because I am, uh, well, it's not springtime, but I am going to Berlin in September to, uh, you no, know, no, no, to, no, 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 because the cold weather is, is, is something akin to um, the shrinkage factor. Yeah, let's the not shrink- go there. Let's go back to Greg's question. <laughs> about <laughs> people who say you haven't been shooting much this year. I was, I was, I was, I'm also curious, as, as, uh, as I get older, I tend to photograph older models. And, and not younger ones. Do you find yourself, as you look ahead, uh, photographing women perhaps who aren't so perfect in their physical form or maybe have more flaws or aged? Because uh, there's a yeah, lot well, of beauty. Yeah, there, yeah so. I, you know, the cover, the cover model from my Paris book is, was in her mid forties when we photographed that. Uh, there's a woman uh, in her early sixties in, mm-hmm. uh, in the Polaroids book. Um, you know, again, you listen to these women, and mm-hmm. part of why they're doing this is because there's something that they don't like about themselves. There's something they want to overcome about the way they feel about the way they look. There's a confidence that they want to tap into. Mm-hmm. And, and quite frankly, I mean, for me, the reason that I started this work, the reason that I did it uh, and continue to do it and continue to sort of take sustenance from it is... I'm examining what was taken, <clears throat> excuse me, what was taken from me, you know, because of various prejudices and societal norms and demands, you know, I didn't get to have a 20s through the 40s like, like I should have. And I'm angry about that. So, you know, I'm looking to explore, um, you know, I, I, I want to see what my life would have been like if I had been out you know, in my 20s, as opposed to... you really you think know. that you could do that? No, so so go, uh, going back to that, you want to ex- uh, explain that a little bit more. You want to explore what would happen in your life if you were able to come out earlier in your life in your 20s. Is that what you were saying? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and so, how, how, how would you create that? Well, I created by photographing these women who are so fearless, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so, you know, I may get, as I get older, I may want to see what, you know, what, what's taken from us as we age, but that, that's, you know, my, my, my jam, if you will, you know, was visually seeing uh, and being around women who, who were fearless, um, you know, during a time period in their lives when I wasn't in mine. Mm, so, you know, I, you know, I want to tap into this ballsy sensuality that, you know, the, these women have no problem accessing, uh, exploring, um, you know, I, that to me is just absolutely fascinating because I didn't get it. You know, I, I, 
uh, yeah, I mean, when I should have been doing certain things and, you know, I, I was going to law school because I was going to be, you know, the, the, the uh, uh, untouchable, you know, professional person. And then I could start looking at these other issues in my life, but I didn't, you know, and, and so, you know, from my twenties to my, you know, I, we've been allowed to be married for less than like, it was just five years the other day. You know, I didn't, I wasn't allowed to get married till I was in my fifties. Um, you know, I brought my first gay rights case as a litigator in 1990, you know, so it's been a long haul. Uh, what do you mean you weren't allowed to? I don't understand that. <laughs> Uh, same sex marriage. Same sex marriage. Yeah, oh, okay. Yeah, because I'm a lesbian, I, I wasn't allowed to get married until about five years ago. So, are, are, are most of your are most of your models lesbians? I uh, no. Uh, you know, they're they're all over the map. Um, you know, and that's another fascinating thing to me is these women. They they don't label themselves. You know, they're mm -hmm. not this. They're not that. They're not the other thing. Um, you know, they're exploring, they're fearless, they, you know, that's the, the energy that I, that I want to explore. Exciting. Um, I, I think there's something that, bothering me that, that since it's been said that I, I, I want to talk about here, I could, um, okay. the conversation was about how your models are all just so damn beautiful. And I, I'm looking through some of your work online going, I think that has a lot to do with the photographer. Um, it, it, it's, it's, I mean, I, I photographed a lot, I do headshots, so I, I don't do news, but I mean, you know, people say, oh, she's so pretty. I said, well, you know, it's, it's, it's a pretty good photograph. I had something to do with the expression on her face because of how I talked to her and, and how she felt. And I mean, I like to take pictures of, of people who look like they're just having a really good day, you know? Um, yeah. and so I'm wondering how much you feel uh, that your work with these models influences how beautiful they are. I mean, uh, Leibovitz has said that it's not her responsibility, but the, the, the look on their face isn't her responsibility. I'm going, uh, I, I don't, I, I mean, she's a great photographer. I don't happen, don't happen to agree with her. What do you feel about it? Yeah, I, you know, I, to, to me, honesty, authenticity, empowerment are absolutely stunning. They're, they're knockout killer beautiful things. Um, and that's, mm -hmm. that's what I'm after. You know, I want these women to share with me what makes them proud, happy, authentic, um, and powerful. And, and there, there can't help but be beauty, you know, in, in that, um, you know, it's, uh, I, I, uh, Douglas Kirkland, Douglas and Francoise Kirkland lived around the corner from me in, uh, in LA, in, in Laurel Canyon. And they wrote uh, an introduction for one of my books. And uh, I started uh, getting to know them when I interviewed Douglas for, uh, again, it might've been Black and White Magazine or, or something. And Douglas uh, had a quote that just so stuck with me. And it was something along the lines of, he didn't find that it was clever to make people look bad. You know, Remember I mean- what, he, Say that again? I didn't hear he, you. He, yeah, he didn't think that it was clever to make people look bad. And, you know, because he, he gets, uh, you know, uh, some pushback, you know, because he does, you know, celebrities and they always look happy and, you know, glossy and, you know, and he said, you know, I, I just, it's not clever to me to make them look bad. That's, that's you know, I, I don't get any joy out of that. Um, excuse me, you know, and then you have people like Bruce Gilden, you know, running around, you know, putting cameras and flashes in people's faces on the streets and things, you know, and I, you know, I, I would prefer to fall into Douglas's camp, you know, I, I want to know, you know, be, because I couldn't access that within myself, I couldn't access that fearlessness, that pride, that authenticity, that sensuality, all of those things that these women now, uh, you know, of a certain age, can, can just they, they have no compunction about exploring these things, about, um, you know, trying to find that power within themselves. So, yeah, I, uh, that, that's, that's part of the, the, the motivating factor. But the yeah, I don't know part, if you see but, Jim's question in the chat, but go ahead, Michael. But the other part of it is, as we, psychologically and physiologically, as we, as we get, as we, 
grow from a child to a teenager to a young adult, we hit certain, I believe, that we hit certain um, intellectual levels uh, where we begin to find other interests that we're uh, um, uh, inclined to uh, want to either try or venture off to, okay? Um, but once you reach the next or the following plateaus, it doesn't seem logical to me that you can go back into your mind and say, well, I wonder if I, if I had tried this when I was that age, what it would be like. Can't do that. Well, I, think, I you do that. think you can. I think you can. I think, I think well, she's on to something. Not, not, only, not only do I think you can, yeah. but ask, and ask any gay person, you know, what mm -hmm. uh, of, a cer of a certain age, what it would feel like for them to not have been, you know, just hit with a tsunami of self-loathing and- uh, But the know, reason uh, why they can do that, or they think they can do that, is because of all of the knowledge and information that they gathered years later, and then to try to take that, that all that metadata and go back into their life when they were like 18 or 19 years old and say, well, I could have done this and I should have done that. And I, I don't know what that actually means. Also, well, imagine a lot of societal changes that they can react yeah. to. And, and pe people are so unique, Michael. You, you can't say one thing for everybody. Everybody no, has I, a and I, and I, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not trying to. And some people can do it, and some people can't. Um, I, I don't think you can come up with anyone, this is the way it is. It, it's, it's, life is too complicated. I think, people, statistically, I think that statistically, it's a lot difficult to do that. Then There's and, no statistics on that. Yeah, sure there are. Well, Absolutely there are. Well, go ahead, as, Elizabeth. As, as the only woman that's showing her face aside from Renee, and yeah. I have done a naked project with 150 women um, from the ages of 18 to, uh, to 86, um, I could touch on all the subjects that Renee was discussing. And I think as men, you guys really need to step back and look at women in a different way and quit objectifying um, TNA or pussy or whatever you want to call it. Um, I think, you know, her as a lesbian woman, myself as a straight woman, non-binary woman, fluid woman, whatever title you want to give me, I don't care. Um, I'll take them all. I think you need to look at women differently with some intellectual capacity, you know, and um, Jeff making a comment saying that, um, I'm not sure what the grotesque part was of a woman, but I photographed women that were, you know, 350 pounds and they're absolutely gorgeous. So, um, an 86 year old and I photographed myself and the whole project started with me not being able to find beauty within myself. And I finally, after I was, that was when I was gonna turn 50, it was a long time ago, but, um, you know, I think we do enough head trips as women on ourselves and we certainly don't need it from an exterior influence also. So my loving words to you guys are, please check yourselves before making your comments because we have enough societal pressures about being the feminine female with boobs that we can't show because society says it's a sexual organ. So that's my rant. And, you know, go Renee, I love your work. So, Thank so, you, Elizabeth. So, 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 so Elizabeth, uh, what suggestions would you have, or, or Renee kick in too, for um, old white guys who enjoy the female <laughs> figure to mm -hmm. step back and, and look at ourselves first before we talk or we collaborate with the model? What suggestions would you have? You know, I, a lot of times, I mean, I did um, all kinds of women. I, they were straight, gay, trans. Um, most of the times it was me putting my camera down for hours and crying with these women because it didn't matter whether they were perfect. I had a yoga instructor that she doesn't have an ounce of fat on her. She's been modified, but I mean, she's got a perfect figure. But her mother shamed her her entire life 
growing up saying that she was going to be fat if she put certain things in her mouth. And that woman is so scarred. And these are demons that we all carry within us. I don't care if you're a man putting plugs in your head or a woman. You know, these are demons that nobody sees that we need to be um, a little more sensitive to the human being across you. And I would say, put your camera down and have a conversation. I had my women fill out a form aside from a release with questions um, just to get into their mindset a little bit before I photographed them. And then we would have a conversation. And many times it was a three hour shoot just because we were, you know, talking, crying, laughing, all these things. And yes, in some of my shoots, I did get naked because they're like, why do you have clothes on if you're photographing me naked? So I would take my clothes off to make them feel more comfortable. So um, you do whatever you can, you know, to, to make these people relax, feel beautiful, regardless of age or size, mm -hmm. sexual preference, color. It's, it's really easy if you just want to listen before you bring up your camera to your face. You know, all of us in photography are artists. No different than somebody that has a brush with, with paints or pigments and putting it on a canvas, all right? If you take the history of art back, not that far back, if you take the sculptures of Rodin or the, or the paintings of Valero, um, uh, almost every single painting that you see in a museum of that era are um, robust, heavy set women. Somewhere along the line, the, the image of a model changed in photography. I have no idea why or or not in every country. A, it was society. It was society things. No, Maybe it was an it was an advertising thing. But, but oh. not in every country. Have you seen? Yeah. They they have uh, uh, collections of pictures of uh, women uh, from different countries as to what people in those countries consider a, attractive, and it is significantly different. I mean, seriously, significantly different. Everything from Twiggy to uh, Rubens, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's, it has to do with advertising, with, advertising, no, yeah, it's yeah, because the, uh, because the, because the, because the clothing on, on, on the, uh, on the original models from advertising, they were, they were thin, they had uh, a big, big breasts. Um, uh, it, it was a certain stereotype that that went into the creating of, of, of an image St stereotypes oh, were formed long before too. advertising came along yeah well, i think i think you got you have no, to but go it back. was accelerated but it was accelerated once advertising happened yeah but you have to go back to the fashion houses and and who dictated what and and then it was advertising and and still it's you know society via all these media types that are putting these these okay is a size two this year or a size eight and when you have finally you know Paris fashion saying okay we can't have women dying anymore from anorexia and bulimia and you have to weigh a minimum of a hundred pounds it's fucking ridiculous I mean come on I, I mean we really need to check ourselves yeah Harris did you want to say something no he's yes, still coming out the yeah, from his I did uh, <laughs> I, I guess it's a complicated question um, Renee knows I've been a supporter of her work ever since I first saw it, and uh, one of my regrets at UArts was not being able to exhibit it. Um, I'm still hoping to do something with her and her work, um, and and I and I think it's a complicated question, and and my question is kind of a twofold question, which is well, first um, I'm sure you know Nancy Hellebrand has been working and posting about um, women who are very, much older. And they're nudes, and it's and I think the project is called "Women Is Beautiful," and it's a really compelling project. And I, I think John, it'd be wonderful to have um, Nancy here on, on your on your talk because I think it would dovetail beautifully with what Renee and Elizabeth are talking about. And the other thing is that um, <clears throat> you know I I would say most of, most of the best photographs I've made, you know, the photographs I think are the strongest in my life happened to be of the woman I loved, happened to be of Nancy. And at one point um, I had to get a model release from, from her 
<laughs> so I could, so these, some of these photographs could be published. And she found that really, really offensive and upsetting. But it, it did kind of get to the, to the, um, to the point of how we work with people we love, how we work with our spouses. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I know that a lot has been written about um, Alfred Stieglitz and O'Keefe and accusing O'Keefe of really use light, using O'Keefe. Um, but then there, of course, there was O'Keefe, there were charges that O'Keefe played upon her, her sexual image and Stieglitz's work to help propel her career. Um, either way, they both seem to have been extraordinary people, um, at least in, in aggressively ambitious. But, um, and I'm wondering for you, how does that conversation go working with your, um, you know, your loved one and having her nude and, and all of those conversations as a relationship? Abe, I need a model release. <laughs> a model release would be like a like a prenup. <laughs> well, well, I I talk about that all the time. That that okay, I um I I I, I, I I do have model releases from uh, some women I was involved with who are no longer in my life. Um, that's funny. How have I managed to let this one slip through the cracks that I have not? not what did she a, say? Uh, what was her answer? She, she was like, no, you haven't gotten one for me. And then she ran away. <laughs> <laughs> but no, no, I mean, we both get too much joy when she's in a magazine article or in an exhibit or, you know, uh, on the wall. So uh, I, I, I think I can get her to sign something. But yeah, cool. thanks for pointing that out, guys. <laughs> I, I want to say that one of, one of the most interesting things anybody has ever said to me um, well, I, I shoot men, women, kids, I, it's headshots and then a little bit of portraits. There's no news, there's nothing. Else. But I, I often have long conversations with people in order to get them to give me the expressions that, that I want, which is them in a good mood, right? So I had, I've shot trans men and trans women because that's who was in front of my camera. It wasn't and it wasn't because they were trans. It was just, I was shooting their They're humans. They're just yeah, people. They're humans. And so I had uh, one of my favorite uh, people to photograph happens to be a trans man. He's, he is muscular and tattooed and, and, and he's played Hamlet both as a male and a female. I mean, he's just amazing <laughs> he's looking, so right? And so we're done with our first photo session. And he says to me, wow, you really get me. And I'm going, um, okay. <laughs> I, 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 it, it's, it's not that I get the trans or the cisgender, it, it's, it's a person. So the more you, uh, uh, Elizabeth said, you know, you gotta talk to people. Yeah, yeah, you really, you really need to have serious conversation with the people if you want to have photographs of them that are real. Uh, I mean, I, I imagine you can do it with models, but I've never shot models. Yeah. Um, you, know, it, you were talking about, uh, you were talking about photographers uh, that, that, uh, that you wanted to shoot, you know, older people, a lot older. And the first photographer that I can remember that, that shot uh, older women, is Joyce Tennyson. She did a whole series of, of pictures of, uh, of, of older women um, not that long ago. She did a book on them. So it's, it's not, a, it's not a, 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 a new thing. It's, it's just, um, it's a recurring type of, of uh, artistic uh, understanding of, of our society. Because we're, we're not getting any younger. But I, I don't am. think <laughs> yeah, her series women. Steven. Sure. Oh, no, 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 no. I refuse we're, we're to get older. No, 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 no. We're talking about, you know, physically, actually, not, intellectual, I'm, I'm not actually intellectually. Getting, I'm actually getting younger. Um, I'm I'm more petulant, less tolerant of <laughs> bullshit. Um, I only do things that are fun. Uh, I don't give a fuck what other people think. Uh, so I'm actually getting uh, younger, and I, I do honestly think that uh, high school in the United States is one of the biggest killers 
of creativity because when you get into high school, the pressures of conformity um, uh, are such that that people end up stifling their creativity. Hey, Jeff, just um, because you're masturbating a lot more now doesn't mean you're getting younger. Yes, but the... Um, it depends. It depends. What? When okay, I let's go back to Renee. The devil made me say that. When yes, I left the world of video, it. I announced to my video friends I was going to go take pretty pictures. And I, and I have. I, I, I've pretty much just taken, I mean, that's all I really want to do. I don't want to, mm -hmm. to, to photograph angst. I don't want to photograph war. I, I just want to take pretty pictures. And I, I've managed to stick to that. So, you know. Well, I think I'm going to kind of side with Renee here because um, I've shot for decades beautiful people, um, lots of nudes, lots of nude women. Uh, I have never done guys because that would be a, a commercial disaster for me for one reason or another. But I have never found it difficult to be comfortable with people. I mean, to a large extent, many, many, many of these people have always been my friends because of the, my world. Um, and um, uh, I've never found it hard to get comfortable with them or with them with me. And we're all still friends. And they could be walking around entire, women entirely naked. I never think about, yeah, I think about the fact they're naked, but we're, just, we're friends. And I, I understand where they're coming from, from a business sense from a, an accomplishment sense and everything else. We don't have long conversations to get comfortable. I don't need questionnaires. We shoot for about 10 minutes and we're comfortable and then we're just having fun. So I think Renee, when she's meeting these people and they become her friends and she's, yeah, like, hey, let's go shoot. Um, I really understand that. Uh, it's, it's not the same for everyone. And that's the way it is for me. And I suspect that it is for Renee. I think Elizabeth. I think Elizabeth is pointing out that those shared experiences can be, uh, as men, we can broaden our exposure to what we're thinking about in terms of shared experiences. I think Renee is pointing out that there are a lot of people that we photograph, a lot of women that we might photograph that have a lot of things that they have occurred to them in their younger years, as well. well I, I, now, what I'm saying is, I don't have that problem. Uh, I'm not. Okay. I completely agree, agree with Elizabeth, but I don't objectify people like that i don't it's not the way i am never has been but i appreciate what elizabeth is saying i certainly do but i'm i'm more on the side of renee she's photographing people that are essentially have become her friends or have been her friends and they just happen to be gorgeous um i want to circle back i i i'm I'm, I'm sort of a, a Luddite when it comes to Zoom and all these things, but I, okay. so I see some of these uh, questions pop up or comments that I, I only see a portion of. Jim uh, had said something earlier about that even moving to France, I still had to overcome something or, or uh, Jim, uh, did you want to talk about something with moving to France or uh, the way uh, shooting is here or uh, well, something? Just, um at, uh, I think Michael was talking about how in, in France, well, from the perspective of the U.S., we have this idealized view of France and British culture is so much more open and accepting of art than we are here, which is true. But as you pointed out, you had a model on a bridge and a van full of cops showed up. Um, then we can talk about why a van full of cops had to show up for a single native model. Um, but, they, they literally were just driving by. It, it, they they weren't they weren't <laughs> they were ogling. They, they were ogling. They were they were. <laughs> uh, having lived in France, yes, they are more open, but it isn't because they don't also appreciate female be uh, beauty. There's a long history of um, men appreciating women's bodies and not so much their minds. Um, I love France. I love Paris. I'd, I'd love to get back there soon, but. Um, it's, I mean, the, the cultural differences are fascinating and what is taboo in one place and isn't in other places is a, well, I, I used to study anthropology, I still do. Um, but, and I'm not sure where I'm going with this. I was, in, in answer to your question, just that, that yeah, it's, you know, if, if you were, 
you're more open. I, I think that, that I think there are more open possibilities in France for shooting nudes. But I also been hearing how France is uh, less accepting of photographers shooting on the street, which I think is unfortunate. Yeah. I'm going to shut I mean, up now. <laughs> yeah, I there's just a, a wildly different reception to my work over here. Um, you know, I just uh, we're we're absolutely loving living here. I, it, it's funny because our little hamlet here, you probably any of you that live in a city or a town, you probably see more people in a day than we see in a year. You know, pandemic notwithstanding, mm -hmm. but uh, I, it's you know to go from LA to to this. You know, this little cluster of stone houses, you know, three hundred years old in the middle of nowhere. I mean, good God, people! I'm two hours from an Apple store. You know, it's. <laughs> cool. Well, I'd like to just go back to the image behind you again, because just before we started the conversation, you were saying that was one of your first images. Uh, it was one of the first. I mean, it, it, it is a nude, although it's not really a nude. But um, yeah, it was uh, one of the first shoots uh, where I, the the light was just ridiculous, and uh, you know, I. I knew that I wanted to express something about the moment, something about the light, something about the model. And, you know, probably my favorite body feature of all to photograph is hair. And I just, I love hair blowing in the wind. It's, you know, I just, I love it. So, uh, you know, I very consciously tried to get something like this, but when this exceeded, you know, what I wanted, um, uh, it was, it was sort of revelatory. So it, it felt like the first time that I sort of, it felt like I knew what I was doing, what I what I wanted to say. Great. Also, when we get done here, the image that's that's hanging up behind you, it's a little yeah. cockeyed. It <laughs> needs to be. I mean, it's one of the it's one of my one of my things. About it could be the angle of the camera yeah, on it too. Yeah, the angle though. that she's sitting. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's a little yeah I, I've, I've I've got I've got my laptop propped up on a bean bag, so <laughs> it's not exactly. Everything's going to be wonky. Yeah. Cool. Well, so, Renee, Renee, thank you so much a, for this. Renee, yes. just a quick comment. I got a couple of thank yous. I actually bought your book. Well, oh. I, I do that whenever John brings interesting people and I, you know, get to meet them for the first time. It's like, oh, I got to buy their book. So I buy <laughs> their book. I, I love PayPal. Um, but the other thing that I wanted to thank you for, and it's this is a great issue. I'd never seen Photo Nostrum. Uh, oh. and and you know, I've been living in a fucking cave for the past year, but um, you're in really grand um, company with Helmut Newton, Avedon behind the scenes, and Renee Jacobs. Uh, so congratulations on that. I'm I'm gonna study that a little bit more. Thank you, and uh, you're all welcome uh, for the vernissage in Barcelona on October seventh. So come on over. Give me some frequent flyer miles and I'll be there in a heartbeat <laughs> with bells on my toes. <laughs> Very cool. As they're saying, thank you so much, Renee, for being here for this. Uh, and thank you, Tony, for introducing us. Thank you, Tony. <laughs> Do you have any parting words you want to say before you go? Well, if there were other questions, I, you know, I see the number 57 on my screen. I have no idea what that means. I don't know if folks <laughs> were commenting or they had questions, but you know, if there are any other questions, you know, I'm, I'm happy to, to take a take a. Yeah, I will send you a, a, a log of the chat so you can look at that afterwards. OK, yeah, uh, if, if anybody has any uh, any other questions. Yeah, Robert or... wants asking if there, if there are photographers you admire or draw inspiration from. Yeah, uh, we, we touched on that a, a bit at the beginning. Um, I, you know, I love, you know, the, the sort of old school folks. Um, Lartigue and uh, Cartier-Bresson, you know, my, my early grounding was in uh, photojournalism and, you know, Mary Ellen Mark and uh, Eugene Smith. I, I used to love, uh, you know, I was a diehard, <clears throat> excuse me, diehard photojournalist. My, the first dog I ever had was this black and white shaggy mutt, just adorable, but, you know, black and white. So, you know, I named him Smith after uh, W. Eugene Smith, so. <laughs> What are some of the photographers that uh, um, 
current photographers that uh, you sort of um, look at and possibly draw inspiration from? Yeah, they're they're not names, you know. They're 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 people you names you wouldn't recognize, and and I don't even know. Um, thanks, Tony. Good to see you. Um, you know, there are so many people on Instagram uh, running around with Polaroids and and doing really interesting stuff. Um, you know, there 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 aren't a whole bunch of sort of current mm. names that are um, in the. Um, uh, the sort of pantheon that that really inspire me all that much at the moment but uh you know instagram every day is a daily feast so i think we didn't really touch on instagram and its censorship though uh okay. is that something you want to yeah. talk a comment about yeah i mean you know just I, I i loathe censoring the work and and thank you all for everyone that's sending thank yous and i i get that you have to go and, and thanks for joining us um, you know, I, I hate censoring my work on social media, but I, you know, I'm also a recovering lawyer and I get that it's their playground and, and their rules. You know, mm -hmm. it, it's not a quote, free speech, first amendment issue. I, you know, I of have course. no right, to, you know, to put my nudes uh, up on social media. I just don't. And I, I try and play by their rules, which makes it even more difficult when I do get dinged uh, and I get dinged from time to time, but I, I, you know, and I censor the hell out of my work. But my, you know, my, my overarching feeling about that is online is not the way to view images. It's just not, you know, either, you know, buy a print, buy a book, go to a museum, whatever. Um, you know, you, you just can't get the nuance of a photograph on social media. Um, it's the cropping and the censorship and the, it's just, it's not the same experience. So, you know, I use it as a necessary evil. I loathe the censorship. But at the end of the day, I, I sort of, you know, take cold comfort in the in, in my feeling that it's it's just not the best way to see imagery anyway. Mm -hmm. Cool. But it's an, it should be used as an advertising tool. And and I do that. I you know I I, I do that a lot. So. Yeah. I wonder why well, there there people have there are people have a. Um, They really don't like to buy images um, from uh, the internet. Um, they have a reluctance. They they want to, and I I get it. They want to they want to see it with their own eyes. They want to feel it. They want to touch it. They want to sniff it. Um, but um, that that sort of curtails being able to show somebody, let's say in England, in Pakistan, not Pakistan. Uh, in in Israel, in 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 China, in in Japan. The 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 products that artists are um, are trying to show the world. I, I don't agree with your blanket statement. I, I have a friend who's been selling vintage prints online and. But vintage publishing. prints. What do you mean by vintage print? Um. Prints by Weston and Stieglitz. Don't even go but there. He's been, he's been doing those that are for names, 40 years. Those, but but those, the names that you're talking about are well-known, established photographers. Exactly. And, have, and I'm talking about, what about the current photographers? How, do you, how does the current photographer become a vintage photographer? If they not... There's, there's I, some of the all you got to do is die. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. right. Jack, did you want to say something? Yeah, there are people making money on online selling it through some of the art stores and stuff, but it takes a lot of marketing. There's a whole process and everything, but you can't make a statement that people aren't making money on it. There are people making money right now, um, and I have friends of mine telling me, you know, friends of theirs are making a lot of money, but it's Jack. Let me ask them what 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 can you quantify? What is a lot of money? Are they selling stuff for fifteen hundred, twenty five hundred dollars a, a print? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're they're making they're making a good living at it, but it takes a lot of work. The mistake people have is they think, oh, I'll just put something up, and it'll get sold. Okay, it, so if they're making, so happen. if it takes a lot, if it takes a lot of work and a lot of marketing, I should have asked my question differently. Are they making a profit? Yes. 
you don't know what somebody's making as a profit unless you're unless you're making the deposit in the bank for them. You, you mm -hmm. you're taking a point of view that you're gonna see you're gonna stay there. You're gonna take that point of view and and you're not getting off of that. You're not willing to listen to people actually are making money at it. How do you know what professional Yeah, they I agree with yeah, you. I think that's a separate conversation from yep. here. Yep. We'll exactly. take that up on one of our open discussions. Renee, can I ask a question about your workshops and, and how yeah. How do people get the best out of the workshop? How do they get the best out of the workshop? Um, you know, it, uh, wow. Um, you know, it's so unique and, and uh, individual for, for everyone. Um, you know, uh, you, you, they have to be open. In, in my mind, they have to be open to hearing what models have to say about themselves. So, you know, I, I usually draw from a, a fairly narrow sliver of models that I've worked with for a long time that I know are incredibly powerful in their authenticity. And, you know, it, it's like, I, I, I I, I worked as an assistant for workshops, you know, over the years, you know, before I really, you know, started to uh, go off on my own. And, you know, the whole idea of, you know, a cattle call line of people and the model doesn't know where to look. I, you know, I just, I, I can't stand that. Um, it's, to me, it's very much about listening to what these models have to say. And I pick the models based on what they do have to say. You know, they're not shrinking violets. They're not you know, it, it, it depends how much you want to access someone's authenticity. Um, you know, and people, there are plenty of people that don't, you know, that they just, they, the headless, you know, the bodyscape, and, and that's fine, that's great, but that's, you know, that's not what I, and I can, I can take anybody who does that work and make them better. There, there's no question about it. You know, it's like, no, you don't cut, you know, at this joiner that, you know, it, it, but for me, if people are going to come here, um, they're going to get an earful from all of us, you know, most especially the models, uh, about what it feels like to access their authenticity. Can you be more specific about authenticity? What the uh, subsequent uh, I mean, questions? It's, yeah, it's it's the no bullshit factor. It's like. Um, I, I see photographers quite often, you know, in their bios and things saying, you know, see the world the way I see it, you know, see through my eyes. And, and you know, that, that's great. But in the work that I'm trying to cultivate with, with women, I want the world to see through their eyes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and the photographer is the conduit. And, and, and that's great. And we all have our imprints and our stamps, you know, that we put on, on the images and, and how they get into the world. But to me, I want them to hear from these women about what it is they're feeling by doing this type of work, how it empowers them, how it, 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 it increases their confidence, what they have to say about, uh, about accessing a certain level of sensuality, sexuality, um, <coughs> that, that they feel, you know, for the really some of the first times in history, you know, women are being allowed to do that and, you know, what it means for them uh, and what it means moving society forward. So, Do you have any examples of where people have, or your models have used that photograph to accelerate their own growth or their own expansion of what they're trying to do with their dreams? And yeah. Yeah, um, I, I can give just one sliver of an example. The cover model on my Paris book uh, was in her mid 40s when, when we shot that. Um, yeah, Jim, everybody come on over to France. Uh, we'll have a great time. <laughs> um, and she came to me because she had seen my work and she, you know, she knocks on my door in, in Paris. This was, I think, my first first trip to Paris and I was shooting. I didn't have a book in mind at that time. You know, she knocks on the door. We'd, we'd set up a time. And I open the door and this woman is absolutely magnificent. Absolutely magnificent. She'd never done any, any modeling. She was an, she's an actor. 
Uh, and so her purpose for connecting was she thought that we would be able to find something together that would help her further access a, a sort of authenticity that she could use in her acting. She'd never really done any modeling. She certainly hadn't done any nude modeling. She's probably the only model that I photographed every single time I went to Paris. Be she became one of my dearest friends, taught me how to really be French, you know, how to, how to live in France. And it's really, it's, it's two important things. And Tony, if he's still here, is gonna be bored hearing this again. Okay, to live in France, this, this model taught me, it is exactly six twists on the champagne, the wire to open it. Every, <laughs> every bottle of sparkling and six, it's always six twists. And you send the damn champagne back if it's not cold enough, even if it takes three times. So, you know, it's, it's important to, to know these life lessons, but no, but seriously, I mean, she um, came to me because she wanted to access something in herself. And she was just thrilled that I wanted, you know, that I would consider shooting with her. I mean, this woman walked in the door and I just about fell the fuck over. I mean, one of the most magnificent people I've ever seen in my life. And um, she, you know, was so uh, unsure about her skill as an actor and, and her, you know, being able to access certain levels within herself. It's like, you, you think I can help with that? Fantastic. Let, you know, let, let's have at it. So. Renee, just curious, who is your average um, workshop student? Um, a lot of folks from the U.S. Uh, I, you know, I, I've had, oh, uh, women, men, um, you know, from, from mostly America, from, you know, but now uh, the word's getting out, you know, because I, I had started with a, a clientele in, in the States. Um, and more of my collectors than my students were over here in Europe, which is one of the big I, I wanted to come here. But, um, you know, I've had folks from the Netherlands. I have uh, folks from Germany, um, you know, pretty, pretty much all over. Do they have something specific in mind that might be different when they show up than uh, what they walk away with? Yeah. In the way um, I, I I, I think so because I, you know, I, I, I am not shy about um, sexuality or eroticism, and you know, if the models are comfortable with that, then we go there. Um, you know, it's uh, I, you know, to me, it's all about respect, and and again, I keep going back to the word authenticity, but. Um, I'm not going to just have folks come here and, and just, you know, take pretty pictures. I, they can do that and that's fine, but it's, it's a wasted opportunity because I, I really, you know, handpick these models because they're fearless, um, you know, and they, they, they know themselves, uh, they know their bodies, they, they know, uh, they, they know how to express not only you know visually with their bodies, but emotionally and and verbally, what it means to feel empowered, and you know they they look for that. I mean, none none of the models that I use for my workshops are there, you know, just as a payday. Um, these are you know women that I've worked with a long time, and you know we just we we sort of keep building and you know building this um, this, this story of empowerment um and you know i i i just feel incredibly privileged that they share it with me and um you know it's okay. allowed me to do it. let me answer something um yeah. going back to this this authenticity um obviously each of your models has a different facet of their lives that equates to what you call authenticity so when you have a workshop, you pretty much understand those different facets of this, this, this gem we call a, a model. Mm -hmm. During the course of your workshop, do you tell uh, your, your students um, to pick, do some images that, um, that portrays a particular facet of her authenticity and you pick the facet 
and what each of those photographers shows at the end of that particular session. No, um, you know, I, I try and be the, the, the connector um, between the two, you know, I- Facilitator, okay. Yeah, I mean, I, yes, they're, they're, well, because again, I mean, there are certain facets of these women that I need. You know that that I have needed for myself in my own work and to understand you know a lot a lot of things about myself. That could be you know obviously different for a different photographer, a different person. Um, you know I just I want to make sure that the model and the photographer are on, are on the same wavelength about that. Um, I mean I I'm happy you know when when students come here you know I'm happy to talk to them about you know, photo shoots that I've done with these models or, you know, things that, that we, you know, in the past have tried to access or, or um, you know, put forward, you know, and I'm happy to sort of discuss that. But more than anything else, you know, I mean, I've, I've had people come who are, you know, street photographers, commercial photographers, uh, you know, people who are picking up a camera pretty much for the first time, you know, so they're looking to try and understand different things, you know, with, with the female nude. And, you know, it's, I, I don't feel that it's my job to tell them what they should see, but I want to make sure that they're accessing as much as they can from what these women have to offer, you know, as, as models, as people. Um, so it, it's, it's I, I'm happy to share my experiences, but I don't, you know, I, I'm not uh, one of those uh, workshop instructors where I want to get to the end of a workshop and see, you know, photographs that look like mine. Um, you know, that that's not what it's about to me. Um, you know, it's about finding, uh, you know, different facets of these women that, you know, they, you know, I mean, they, they, the, the model and the photographer might have a, you know, a shared interest, uh, you know, a fennel growing in the garden or something, you know, or, I mean, whatever it is, um, you know, that, that is some kind of touchstone um, emotionally or visually, or, you know, I, that, that to me is the interesting connection. Well, Renee, it's been two hours and I'm <laughs> say it, it's been very worthwhile. I, I've enjoyed mm -hmm. seeing your work. I've enjoyed hearing what you've had to say and discovering what you do. So I, I'm very appreciative. So from me, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Same this here. Was thank you. Two hours. Thank you all. Yeah, yes, was, thank uh, you. It was time thank well you. spent. Thanks. Thank yes. you. I have Everyone one thing to say before we, I have one thing to say before we <laughs> stop. Wait a second, stop the recording. <laughs> <laughs>